If you have your Bible, you're going to want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 24. 1 Peter is a small book in the New Testament. It's Hebrew, Hebrews, James, and then 1 Peter. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 24. I got to admit, though, it was a little sad looking up here and not seeing little Jeffrey here, uh, our worship pastor. He's my little buddy. Anyway, no. He and his family, they're on, they're on vacation, and so I appreciate our worship team, and they, they did a fantastic job, as they always do. So if you were here last week, um, I said that last week's sermon and today's sermon are really just one, one big sermon that, that we kind of chopped up in half. Um, so if you missed last week, you're, you're going to be completely lost. So just get on Facebook, do, do what you want to do for the next, no, I'm just kidding. Let me catch you up, okay? Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. Let me catch you up. So last week we talked about would-be followers. These are people who are, <clears throat> who are close, you know, really close to being followers of Jesus, or they're thinking about saying yes to Jesus, but they're not quite there. Matter of fact, we looked at Luke 9, 57 through 62, and, and we saw three guys in Jesus' interaction with them. And, and I told you that Jesus really, he wasn't really a good salesman to these guys. He didn't come out and, and really make a strong pitch for following him. And he didn't give out all the, <clears throat> give, give out all the benefits of what it means to be a follower and, and all the good things that are going to happen and all the joy and all, all the great stuff. He really didn't sell it that way. Matter of fact, what he did was he, he told them why following him wouldn't be easy. He told them why following him was going to require sacrifice. In fact, what we said last week was what moves someone from would-be status to taking that first step and following Jesus is how we would answer basically these three questions. And I'll give them to you again. It says, will you choose to live Jesus' way? And that, that's a question that goes right at our comfort. And the next question was, will you change your priorities? And that's a question that goes right after our own agendas. And then the last question we asked last week was, will you cherish Jesus above all things? And that's a question that goes right, right at our commitment. So today, what we're going to do is, is, is we're going to continue on in the sermon. So this is, this is kind of the second half, and it's, it's what, if, what if you answer those questions last week, and, or, or you're thinking about that, and you say, okay, I, I, I'm going to say yes to those. I'm going to say yes to living in Jesus' way. I'm going to say yes to, to changing my priorities, letting him, letting him set my priorities. I'm going to say yes to him. I'm going to cherish Jesus. In other words, I'm going to be committed my, my whole life to that. So what happens if we say yes to following in Jesus' steps? So here we go, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 24, and it says this, For this is a gracious thing, when mindful... Whoa, is that right? Am I right? No, 1 Peter chapter 2, yes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19 through 24. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So I think it's important to know that as followers of Christ, we're never called to be trailblazers. And what I mean by that is, is we're, not, we're not supposed to be making things up. We're not creating new ways. We're not setting out on our own. There's a path that we were to follow. There's already footprints that are leading the way. Um, a couple of weeks back, our family was on vacation. One of the things we did is we went hiking this one day. And um, what we did was there was a trail that we followed. Never did we go, okay, let's go that way into the woods where no one's been before. No, we, we followed a trail and we went up this trail. People had already gone we're, we're walking with us and, and, and going ahead of us, and people had already been there. So we were following a set trail. There was already, we, people had gone where we're gone, and we were doing the same thing. And so when we are going where Jesus called us to go, we're, we're doing what Jesus called us to do, and we're saying what Jesus is calling us to say. So we're not, we're not making things up on our own. We're not kind of going out on our own. And, and I hope this makes sense. We're not explorers in a never explored land. We're not going somewhere where God is not present. We're not doing something that God is, is, is not call, has not already called us to do. We're, we're following him. 
So if we say, I'm in, so if we, if we say yes to those questions, yes, Jesus, I, I'm going to live your way. Yes, Jesus, I, I'm going to let you set my priorities. Yes, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. If you say that, if you cross the line and you say, you know what, I'm not a would-be follower, I'm in. I'm a follower of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, this is in your, in your notes, in your outline. You can follow along here. Well, here's, here's, I'm going to give you three things, which I think that means, and there's, there's more, but I want to give you these three. And the first one is this. Walking in his steps means never letting circumstances dictate obedience. Walking in his steps means never letting circumstances dictate obedience. Obedience. Now, Peter, when he's writing this, this letter, he's writing to believers who are facing struggles and hardships because, as one commentary put it, they're living during a society that is ignorant of the true God. <laughs> Sound kind of like today, doesn't it? They're living during a society that is ignorant of a true God. Because of their faith in Jesus, they were misunderstood and subjected to cruel treatment. And oftentimes that meant they were having to deal with harsh circumstances and persecution from people who, who were in authority over them. Matter of fact, we started in verse 19, but if you look at verse, verse 18, uh, Peter, is, he's addressing servants. Now, some, translation, some of your translations in your Bible, if you look at verse 18, it may say slaves. Now, it, it's, it's hard for us um, here in 2017 to understand slavery in, in the ancient world in, in, in when Peter's writing this. Commentators say that in the New Testament times, slavery was not as bad as that type of slavery that was practiced here in America uh, before and during and, and, and even after the Civil War. Ancient slaves, they had a fairly normal life. Um, often these people sold themselves into slavery for a period of time as a way to get ahead of the world. And, and, and these, were, these were more, again, I, I think when we say the word slave, we immediately go to go to you know, the 1800s and what, all, all the tragedy and, and torture that we saw. But we're talking more about house servants. Um, and so their, their lives were, were fairly normal. And, and it, was, it was hard. I mean, it was hard work. And sometimes it was made even more difficult because of, burden, of, of a burdensome um, master or someone who was in charge over them because they, they, may, they may work for someone who is unkind, uh, who's unfair, and, and oftentimes who would be abusive. But Peter is telling the people here who are hearing this message and reading this letter that even under trying circumstances, even though you're not in the best of circumstances, even though you're in un, unkind, unfair, even though you're, you're in that setting, we're still called to be obedient to Christ, which meant to do good for the people who are in authority. And he used the example of, of if you're being persecuted for doing something wrong versus persecuted for doing something that was right. And he said, you know, if, if you did something wrong and you're punished for it, there is no glory in that. That does, that does not honor God. But what honors God, where, where the glory comes in, is when you're, when you're getting persecuted, when you're getting punished, when, 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 you're, when, you're, when you're facing that, when you're doing what is right when you're doing what God has called you to do, when you're being obedient. He says that's, that's where the glory is. That's where the honor is. That's what God looks upon favorably. And he's saying despite the circumstances that you're under, we're still called to be obedient. And there is this myth that so many of us believe, and, and this is the myth. The myth is, is that life should be fair. Now, we, we, may be, we, we may not say that out loud. Some of us do. But deep, deep, deep down in our hearts, we, we want that. We believe that. We say, you know what? Life should be fair. But if you've lived on this earth long enough, you know that that's, that's really not the case. And here's where Christians, they take that myth to the next level. They say, well, since I'm a believer, things should always, always work out for me. And this goes back to that whole comfort thing that we talked about last week. Are you willing to live Jesus' way, even, even if it's hard? even when it doesn't seem fair, even, even when you don't, you don't feel like it, our obedience to God should never be circumstantial. We should follow God, period. It should never be, well, I'll follow God, well, as long as things are going well, or as long as, as, long as it's convenient, or as long as it doesn't interfere with what I've got going on, or as long as other people are, are doing it with me, or, or as long as, you know, the, those smiths, they, they have to do it too because, because they need to step it up too. That's, that's not obedience. That's selfishness. 
You're trying to work things out for you. You're, you're trying to go on your timetable. You're trying to go when it's convenient for you. You're trying to obey as long as it fits into what you want it to be. But walking in his steps means no matter what's happening around you, you will be faithful. John 6, 38 says, For I, and this is Jesus talking, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Okay, so that verse right there should be pretty convicting to all of us because you know what Jesus just said? He said, I didn't come down here to do my own thing. I didn't come down here to, do, to, to, to set the agenda. I didn't come down here for my convenience. I didn't come to this earth to do what I wanted to do. I came to this earth to do the will of the Father who sent me, no matter what that meant. Acts 5, 27 through 29 says the apostles were brought in. And made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. And they're talking to the apostles. He says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Which is the name of Jesus, by the way, but they weren't going to say it. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Pretty plain and simple. These guys had just, Peter and the other apostles with him, these guys had just been arrested for doing this, for what they had done. And they knew the potential consequences if they would continue to do what they were doing. They were eventually released, but not before that they were beaten. If you look there in Acts, you continue to read verse 40. They, they, they were released, but not before they were beaten. And this wasn't just, you know, giving them a, a charley horse. This was, this, was, this was beaten up pretty bad. I mean, like close to death kind of beaten up. And they knew that this was a possibility. They knew the consequences of their decision. But what Peter says, is, and he's kind of the spokesman of the group because Peter's kind of the talker no matter where he's at. He says, we must. I love that word, must. In other words, we gotta. We have to. There is no other choice. There's no other option. There's no uh, option B, option C, option D. It's just, it's, it's plan A and there is no other plan B. We must Obey God rather than you guys. And not only that, if you keep reading, right after he says that, he keeps talking, and he actually shares the gospel with these guys. He, he talks about Jesus. And, and those are some crazy circumstances. And you and I are, are I'll speak for myself, I, I wouldn't necessarily blame them if, if, you know, if they said, you know, we're fixing, we're fixing to torture, we're fixing to beat you. And, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We'll stop, we'll stop. No one needs to get hurt. Even if they, they kind of like said, okay, we'll stop, you know, wink, wink, and, and, and hit, their, hit their other apostles. Like, Let's say we're not going to do this, and then we'll go out. We'll... They didn't do that. They, were, they, 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 chose, they chose to do it anyway. In spite of the circumstances, they stood their ground. They were obedient despite what was happening to them or what they knew could happen to them. And I wonder, how many times have I disobeyed facing far, far less. How many times have I disobeyed God or not done what he's called me to do or not stepped out on faith facing <laughs> not death, facing not persecution, facing uh, not beatings, facing none of that, but maybe just facing inconvenience or maybe just facing, I don't know, I didn't want to, I was tired. How many times have I disobeyed facing far, far less? It's too hot. <laughs> I'm too tired. What if they laugh at me? I might bother them. People might look at me funny. I don't want to be, I don't want to look like an idiot. It's, it's too hard. I'm not, I'm not good at that. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 says, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken. We're perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do, but we don't give up and quit. Now, Paul, I, I love this. Paul is not dismissing the struggle. In fact, he's, he's acknowledging it. We're, we're pressed. We face troubles, but we don't give up. We don't quit. In other words, the circumstances aren't going to stop us. Circumstances aren't going to determine whether we obey or not. Paul is basically, he's, he's kind of saying it out loud. What we all already know is we're weak. We're weak. We're not perfect. We, we're prone to be weenies, we, but, but we serve a strong and powerful God. We're not crushed. 
Why? Because we have a powerful God. We're not broken. Why? Because we serve a powerful God. We may not understand it, but it's okay. It's okay if we don't get it because God knows. God understands. God is in charge. God is in control. I love that God uses real people to accomplish his will. Do you know that? He uses just just everyday, ordinary people. I think we want to elevate these guys and, and, and women in the Bible as just being, you know, the superhuman. Like when they, when they unbutton their shirt, there's this giant S on, you know, underneath. But really what these were, these were people like you and me, men and women, uh, teenagers who were facing fears, facing struggles, facing hardships. They had all the, same, all the thoughts that we have, they had. But Jesus still chooses to use them. And God knows your faults and my faults, our failures, our weaknesses, our fears, our selfishness. And yet he still says to you and to me, follow me, follow me. And if we say yes, we have to be ready to follow no matter what we face. Circumstances should never dictate obedience. Second thing there, what is walk, if we choose to walk in his steps, well, walking in his steps means this is good news, means that Jesus has already gone first. Jesus has already gone, he's already gone first. And I said this earlier, following in his steps means that, means that we're not trailblazers. It's not a Star Trek moment where we're supposedly, you know, we're supposed to boldly go where no man has gone before. That's, that's not us. Jesus has already blazed the trail. He's already made that path. In fact, in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, it talks about how we need to trust in the Lord. And not in ourselves. Why? Because he will make our path straight. He's already created the path. He, when we go out on our own, we're wandering into to who knows what and into who knows where. We're not following God anymore when we're doing our own thing. We're trying to create our own path. And creating our own path, listen to this, creating our own path is not obedience. You know what it is? It's foolishness. When you try to create your own path, when you try to do your own thing, when you try to follow your own will, go in your own strength, go in your own wisdom, what that is, is that's foolishness. Because God has already laid out a path that he wants us to follow. Think about it. Jesus has already gone first. There's a lot of comfort when you know someone has already, when someone has already done it. Verse 21, uh, back in 1 Peter. It says, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Jesus has already faced all the temptation. Jesus has already faced the ultimate struggle. Jesus has already, he's already faced all the fears. He's already stared down the enemy, and guess what? He won. So this, this should bring us comfort. This should bring us peace. This should bring us boldness. This should motivate us. Jesus, who's asking us, he's asking us to go with him. He's already gone before us, and he knows where he's going. He knows how to get there. He knows how to deal with whatever we're going to face. He will take care of us along the journey. We never, ever go alone. Let me say that again. With Jesus, we never, ever go alone. Our team that, that's on the way back from Africa, God called them to go God called him to join them, and God went with him. It's, it's, that, it's that whole ability that he has to be everywhere at all times. He's omnipresent. That, that prefix omni, and it, it comes from Latin meaning all. So, so to say God is omnipresent means he's, he's all present. He's, he's everywhere. So God has the ability to send us. He has the ability to go with us, and he has the ability to call himself to us. Isn't that crazy? I mean, and it's, it's awesome. We, we, as humans, we can only do one of those, right? Okay, I, I can send you, see ya, or I can be over here on the other end and I can call you, come, or I can go with you, but I can't do all three at the same time. Only God can do that. God says, I want you to go. And then God says, I'm gonna go with you. And God says, and I'm already there where you're coming. So is it, doesn't, that, doesn't, that, doesn't that mean, that I, I, I think about that and that's overwhelming. God has already blazed the trail. God has already, he's already done it. He's gone first. So you'll never go, you'll never go anywhere or do anything that God is not with you and before you. I know this is kind of a silly example, but I, 
As I was thinking about this, I, I think about when you go to amusement parks or, or wherever, if you've been to Six Flags or Disneyland or I don't even know what's out there anymore. I, I don't like any of them except for Disney World. But, um, it's, but it's, you know, when you're in line for, for a, a roller coaster or, or some type of scary ride, typically, uh, unless you have the magic fast pass, typically you're in line for a while and you're just waiting. And, and when it's a pretty scary ride, I mean, you, you hear people screaming, ah, you know, and, and, and you see the ride sometimes coming whizzing right by you really fast, and, and so you get to see that. But while you're in line, a lot of times what you get to see also is you get to see the people coming off the ride, you know, and, and some people are just kind of, their eyes are big and, and they're shaking or whatever, but, but a lot of times what, what brings me a lot of comfort sometimes is when I see just like this little bitty kid coming off the scariest ride, and I mean, and they're, you know, they're just smiling, having a good time, like, okay, what's next? And I see that, and, and I think, okay, Fat little kid could do that, and they, and they survived. Surely, surely, I can handle this. And it brings me great comfort until I actually get on the ride and they strap me down and then I freak out like crazy. But anyway, but the whole idea, the whole idea is, is that, that, that Jesus has already done it. He's already done what he's calling us to do. He knows what it's going to take. He knows, he knows what you're going to need. He knows what you're going to face, and he will be with you every step of the way. Take comfort because Jesus went first. And I want to read you three, three scripture really quickly, uh, and, and I'll talk about them in just a second. Uh, Matthew 20, 28 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 says, Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. And when he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Excuse me. And then John 13, 13 through 15 says, You call me teacher and Lord, and do so correctly, for that is what I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example. You should do just as I have done for you. I love these verses because they remind us that Jesus, he didn't take the easy way out. He didn't take the easy way out. He took the path that was set before him. It was a path, and here's the thing, it was a path that no one else had done before. He walked where his father told him to walk, and because of his obedience, you and I, we can have forgiveness of sin. We are new creations. We can have eternal life with God in heaven. You can do what he's called you to do. You can go where he's calling you to go. You can start whatever it is that he's calling you to start, or you can stop what he's calling you to stop. You can say what he's calling you to say. You can be what he's calling you to be. You can walk in his steps because he knows exactly what it takes. He went first. He went first, and he'll go with you. So that's, that's good news. That's good news, right? Because, what again... We're not trailblazing. We're going through a path that's already been set for us. A path where Jesus is waiting, a path where Jesus is sending us, and a path where Jesus is going with us. He went first, and he knows exactly what he needs. And the third thing there, walking in his steps means our focus is on where we are going and not just where we are. Our focus, when we walk in his steps, our focus is 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 on where we are going and not just where we are. Um, you know what I hate about exercise? Besides the hard work and the effort you have to extend and the running and the heavy lifting and the really tight workout clothes, you know, all, all that stuff. But besides that, you know what I hate? Is there are no immediate results. There are none. Except you get really tired. Okay, okay. Now, I'd be a workout fool if after I did a workout, then my muscles were just significantly bigger than they already are. But, you know, just significantly bigger. Or, or somebody snorted over there. My, my, uh, my waistline, my, you know, I would work out more if, if as soon as I did a workout, my waistline shrunk. You know, if I had rock, rock hard abs. I mean, I, I would be at the gym every day. I mean, everyone would be if it was that easy. But when it comes to working out, you know this, I know this. It takes time, and it takes consistency. The rock-hard abs start coming along maybe in six months, not in, not in six minutes like I wish they did. We, we, are, we are a people. We are a people that live in the moment, and we want 
immediate results. We want the results right now. You know how I know this? Because I, I watch myself and I watch people around it. I mean, we get, we get mad, right? We get mad when our, when our internet isn't lightning fast. Or we get upset when someone doesn't immediately respond to our text. Or we're upset when, when fast food is, isn't really fast. We, we want that five minutes on the treadmill to, to, to equal, you know, like 50 hours in the gym. We, we want it. We want the results. We want it to happen. And one of the things that we have to learn when we are following Jesus is that he is working on an eternal scope and not just on the here and now. But, you know, but that frustrates us about God. I mean, it does me. Why hasn't he answered my prayer yet? Why hasn't he done something already? Why do I have to wait? Why? Why, God? Come on, where are you, God? But God wants us, wants us to obey him, but he also wants us, to under, he, he wants us to obey him in the now, but he also wants us to understand that our obedience in the now is part of a process of, of him helping us to become more and more like him. It's, it's, it's our sanctification. It's, it's becoming more and more like Christ. It's, it's one step. Our obedience today is one step in, in a journey that's ahead of us. Matter of fact, look in verse uh, 24 back in, in 1 Peter. It says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You see, Jesus was willing to suffer that day. Jesus was willing to suffer on that Friday because he knew what it meant for eternity. Jesus was always focused on eternity without losing sight of the importance of the moment. He saw everything through the lens of his Father's will. He saw everything through the lens of his Father's will. You know what champions do that most other people like me don't do? They, they, do, they do the little stuff. They do the daily grind. They, they, they do you know, kind of the boring, boring stuff, but they're consistent with it. Why? Because they've got the bigger picture in mind. They know that today is important. They have to get today done, but they understand that it's more than just today. It's about where they're going. It's about the end result. It's about the, 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 what they're trying to be, the purpose that they're trying to accomplish. People give up. You know why a lot of people give up? Because all they're focused on is today. People give up on exercise. People give up on diets. People give up on, on, on work. People give up on their marriages. People give up on God because they don't see past today. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we read this verse last week, if you remember, since we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every circumstance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you notice there, how did, how did Jesus endure the cross? Because of what? Because of the joy set before him. What is that joy? It's heaven. It's heaven. You see, Jesus had been there before, remember? Jesus was in heaven. He came down to earth to live, to live a sinless life. And, and so he knew where he was going. He knew what was ahead of him. He knew what his obedience on that day would mean for the rest of eternity. He was willing to go to the cross because he knew there was more to it than just that moment. That moment was necessary, okay? And now, please don't hear me minimizing the cross. I am not minimizing what Jesus did. The suffering, the, the beatings, the shame, the humiliation, what he did, it was necessary. It was absolutely necessary. Our sin, our sin made it necessary. Jesus did what he did because he knew what was waiting for him. He knew it was heaven. And he knew that what that meant for us, for you and I. If he went to the cross on that day, on that Friday, he knew, he knew that Sunday was coming. And he knew that what that would mean for us, that we would, we would get to be in heaven if we believed in him and surrendered our lives to him. Romans 5, 3 through 4 says, We also boast of our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance brings God's approval, and his approval creates hope. We boast in our struggles because of what it's going to accomplish in us. Our hope is not in the struggle, okay? Our hope is not in, in, in what we're going through. That's not what our hope is. Our hope is in God who, 
through the struggles, is going to create us to be more and more like him. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to make us to be more like him. That's where our hope is. It's in God. It's not about the present, but what the present is creating in us for the future. As I said earlier, the believers that Peter is writing to are going through difficult circumstances, and they're experiencing persecution. But the message he's wanting them to hear and the message that we need to hear is, just, is, is don't just focus on the now. Understand that the now is what God is using to help you become who he wants you to be. One of the commentaries in, in that Romans passage, Romans 5 through, through 4, one of the commentaries I read said, the actual conditions of life, especially for believers in the midst of a hostile society, are not easy or pleasant. But, but the knowledge of acceptance with God of grace constantly supplied, and the prospect of future glory enables believers to exult in the face of suffering. Did you catch that? Future glory. In other words, you're, it may not seem like what's happening now is, is there's any good in what's happening now, but God wants us to know, he wants us to remember, listen, when you follow me, when you say yes to me, when you walk in my steps, it's more than just now, but it's about the future. It's about what's come. It's future glory. Future glory isn't something that's valued very much in our culture. We're, we're, we're really kind of more about the now glory. We're about the now glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says, For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, some of you may read that and go, light affliction? Light? Jimmy, do you know what I'm going through? Jimmy, do you know what I've experienced? Jimmy, do you know what, what, what I'm walking in, in the middle of right now? Light? How dare you or how dare he call it Light? But do you remember what Paul went through? Do you remember the constant beatings, the constant sufferings? Do you remember the constant persecution that he was under? You know, the times that he was in prison? How close to death he came on more than one occasion? Even in the midst of that, the only reason Paul is able to say light, and he's not minimizing what he went through, and he's not minimizing what we're going through, but what he's saying is, for the believer, compared to what you're about to experience and compared to the future glory, it is, it is light and it is momentary because what we're going to receive is, for eter is, is eternal. It's for eternity. Paul, Peter, Jesus, they were all focused not just on the moment. The moment was important, but they were focused on the future, on where, where this was taking them. Uh, we we uh, did an ATV tour not too long ago and riding four-wheelers, and uh, we had to go through the safety briefing, and, you know, they all have to do it because their lawyers make them do it, and, and it's important. And like most of those things, they, they tell you, they tell you worst-case scenarios. I mean, they don't sell you, you know, so we're just, you know, just going to be following this path and it's going to be, we're not going to go faster than this. Matter of fact, uh, most of you are going to be frustrated because we're going to go super slow and there's going to be dirt in your face all the time. They don't tell you that part of it, right? They're going to tell you, you know, so if, if you come up upon a mountain lion and he's about to eat your, no, they don't tell you. But, you know, if, if, if your ATV catches on fire, here's what you, and they, they go through all these worst case scenarios. In fact, one, one of the ladies in our group, she, it, it freaked her out. She didn't even go on the ride because the, the, the safety briefing, it, it, it completely just it, it blew her away so she just walked back to the suburban and sat there for a couple hours while the rest of us went on our way but anyway one of the things that the instructor said it stuck with me as I was thinking about as I was thinking and writing this sermon she said this she said when you're riding your four-wheeler um, and you end up kind of on a I don't know what you call it just kind of if you're if you're 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 going and you kind of go up on, on on your side like this because that's that's the way the path takes you or the trail takes you kind of this way which by the way we never went through one but she told us what to do in case we did um, so when you go that way she said she said keep your eyes on where you're going she said because where your eyes are that's where your ATV is going to go so basically if you're kind of on the side don't look this way because guess where you're going to go you're going to go that way. She said, keep your eyes on, on where you're going. And how many times, <laughs> how many times have we not done what Jesus asked us to do? Or how many times have we become impatient with God? Or how many times have we become frustrated with God? 
Or how many times have we given up on God all because our eyes were focused on where we were instead of where we are going? How many of us in life, and you may, be, you may feel like you're there right now, you're kind of on the side, and how many of us have looked like that and we said, nope, done. Instead of keeping our eyes where we're headed, and we notice that in a little bit that where we're at, it's going to level off. And Jesus has got us. How many times have we given up because we've got our eyes strongly fixed and focused on where we are instead of where we're coming. Paul said it perfectly. He said, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Walking in his steps means be aware of where you are, but never lose sight of where you're going. Okay, one sermon over two weeks. Sum it up right here. When you say yes to Jesus, it means you're dying to your comfort and never letting circumstances dictate obedience. When you say yes to Jesus, it means dying to your agenda and letting Jesus lead because he's already run the race and he's won it. And he knows what's important and what it's going to take and he's going to run with you. And when you say yes to Jesus, it means you're dying to your timetable and choosing to persevere because our focus is not just on the here and now, but it's on eternity. A.W. Tozer, I love this quote, he says, the reason why many are still troubled, still seeking, still making little forward progress is because they haven't come to the end of themselves. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. Walking in his steps, being a follower of Christ means we can't be in charge. And until, we're, until we realize that, we're not going to say yes. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. My prayer for you and for me is that we'll come to the end of ourselves. Because when we, when we, when we are, are, are weak, then what? He is strong. But he won't be strong in our lives until we are willing until we are willing to get out of the way.